I'd like to introduce uh, the two speakers that we have here today to talk to you about issues in long-term care. Uh, first up, um, or simultaneously, I'm not sure of the order of speakers, uh, we have Katie DeBreer, um, and Katie is legal director of the Florida Health Justice Project. And then we also have Melissa Lipnick, who is an Equal Justice Works Fellow sponsored by the Florida Bar Foundation at Florida Health Justice Project. Thank you both for being here and sharing uh, your knowledge with us and your time with us. Um, and without further ado, the floor is yours. Excellent. Thank you so much, Alexis. And thank you for having us today to present on an issue that is uh, very near and dear to both me and Melissa's heart. Um, so Melissa is going to flip through slides for me. Thanks, Melissa. Uh, so what are we talking about today? Today, we're talking about issues in accessing um, healthcare services through Florida's Medicaid long-term care waiver. This waiver is distinct from another large waiver in the state of Florida, the I-Budget waiver that serves persons with developmental disabilities through the Agency for Persons with Disabilities. The waiver we're talking about today instead is Florida's Medicaid long-term care waiver, which is administered through uh, Medicaid managed care in Florida, meaning that uh, private uh, health insurance plans uh, authorize and uh, reimburse the services through their networks, various networks of providers. So how is the long-term care waiver organized? Um, the home, it is a home and community-based services waiver, which means that uh, the state of Florida has asked the federal government for permission to waive certain provisions, the state plan uh, excuse me, the Federal Medicaid Act, their state plan Medicaid program, so they can provide non-traditional Medicaid services, uh, HCBS wa waiver services, which are meant um, to, in part, provide habilitative care to individuals with uh, disabilities, uh, physical and cognitive, 18 and older. The most recent waiver approved, so Florida submitting an application up to the federal government, to the uh, Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, uh, that was approved on April 1st, 2022. Um, Florida Health Justice Project provided some significant comment to uh, uh, that waiver application, uh, which you can find on our website. The waiver was approved by CMS for five years. Some of the major changes that we wanted to highlight in terms of the waiver approval, um, it increased the number of unduplicated num uh, part participants from 98,000 to 105,000. Um, so a decent uptick in numbers, although we know currently the wait list hovers around, I believe the last time I looked, 54,000 uh, persons long. So uh, a, a an increase, but not one that's gonna cover a significant portion of our wait list. Um, the increased maximum number of participants served at any point went from 76,000 to 84,000. And that, uh, excuse me, the changes between year five of the previous waiver and the year one of the new waiver. So that's just to kind of give you an overall sense of where you can access the new waiver approval, kind of some major changes that are going on. Next slide, please. So as I said, uh, Florida's, um, excuse me, the uh, Medicaid long-term care waiver is administered through Medicaid managed care. That means uh, private health plans administer the care um, through uh, uh, individual contracts with the Agency for Healthcare Administration. And uh, we will um, go further in detail about using those contracts in terms of uh, uh, your advocacy, but you can also access the contracts at that link there below. Um, the model contract uh, is what all uh, managed care plans administering long-term services and support have to incorporate into the individual contracts and have to abide by that law. And you can find some very good information within those contracts about the responsibilities of the private care plans that you can then incorporate into your advocacy. But so it's administered by the Agency for Healthcare Administration. The Department of Children and Families is responsible for determining the financial eligibility for services. And then it's the Department of Elder Affairs who's responsible for determining the Medicaid, uh, medical uh, eligibility and level of care needed. Um, so kind of just generally the process is you call the Department of Elder Affairs and you indicate that you wish to apply for the long-term care waiver. They do an assessment uh, typically over the phone. And after that, that assessment is done um, and 
you are released from the wait list, generally with a very high level of uh, uh, need score, five or above, um, then the Department of Children and Families is the one responsible for at that point processing the remaining um, aspect of the Medicaid application, which is the financial eligibility. We're not going to go into too much detail today about applying for the long-term care uh, uh, managed care program. But again, if you access our website at floridahealthjustice.org, we have extensive uh, resources, uh, both a video series as well as the Advocate's Guide to the Long-Term Care Program, which detail fully the process for applying for the long-term care waiver. So if you have questions about that, I would, um, I would encourage you to go to our website to get those answers. Next slide, please. So this is just generally, again, talking about what services the long-term care waiver um, covers. As I had stated earlier, the uh, long-term care waiver is designed so that it can cover both, um, it covers some traditional Medicaid services as well as non-traditional Medicaid services. Those covered services can be found on ACCA's website, the link here. There's also a long-term care waiver rule coverage policies handbook that details the types of services that the long-term care waiver is responsible for providing once an individual is enrolled and their plan of care is established. Next slide, please. So here's why we're really here. Um, it's to talk about uh, not how to apply or the um, specific characteristics of the long-term care waiver, but instead what to do when you have been um, confronted with an individual who is enrolled on the long-term care waiver, who has asked for a specific service, but who is not getting that specific service uh, to their detriment. So um, we kind of break our advocacy down into uh, three pieces. Um, is it a grievance and or complaint? And those two things tend to live and pair together. Or is it an appeal either internally or through a Medicaid fair hearing? So I'm gonna co cover the details as they relate to filing grievances and complaints. As I said, we pair those together. And then Melissa later on is gonna talk about internal appeal processes and exhausting them as well as proceeding through to a Medicaid fair hearing in front of ACCA's Office of Fair Hearings. So uh, where do you start when the client comes in? Um, are you needing to file a grievance, complaint, or is it time to file an appeal or a Medicaid fair hearing? Uh, and the key question really there, for the most part, um, as a general rule of thumb, is if the client receives something called a notice of adverse benefit determination, we refer to that in shorthand as an NABD. Uh, you can find specifics of that in 42 CFR 438, as well as in ACCA's rule regarding uh, denials of long-term services and supports and other managed care services, which lives at Florida Administrative Code 59G-1.100. Um, a notice of adverse benefit determination is a formal written notice from the managed care plan, letting someone know that they are either uh, reducing, denying, or partially approving or partially denying a requested service. Um, I'm sorry, uh, terminating, denying, partially reducing, or partially approving a requested service. So in that instance, um, you're going to know that that triggers maybe sometimes a grievance or a complaint, but it's really going to trigger an appeal, which is the formal process that Melissa is going to detail more. Um, so was there a termination reduction or denial? Then you're probably more in the realm of filing an appeal or a Medicaid fair hearing, although you may, for various reasons that I'll detail in a second, also want to file a grievance or a complaint. Um, is the issue related to attitudes in terms of uh, the quality of the, the care providers, the case managers who assist the individual in establishing and administering the plan of care? Is it quality of services? Overall happiness with the plan, are they uh, frustrating in as much as, for example, they won't change an incorrect address leading to an inability to communicate with them? then those are great examples of issues that you want to address through a grievance or complaint. So really the key here is if they've if the plan's taken formal action to refuse access to a service and add this adverse action to refuse access to a particular service, that's going to be an appeal, Medicaid if you're hearing, quality of services, um, overall happiness with customer service with the plan, 
that's going to live more in the realm of a grievance or com complaint. Um, point being, there are different avenues for different issues. Let's go ahead. So what is a grievance? Um, you don't need a written adverse benefit determination or in some instances, um, an adverse benefit determination that's not been put into writing, but has been orally provided to the client. So you don't need any kind of uh, notice of denying an access to service. Um, you do need that to trigger an internal appeals process and or a Medicaid fair hearing. So that's why we distinguish. Um, grievances in the grievance process are detailed in enrollee handbooks, and they include information and instructions on how to move through the grievance process. Uh, so each managed care plan has a member handbook that can be accessed on their website. Um, usually I find myself Googling it. Once the client tells me which plan they use, then you can go directly to the plan's website um, that administers the long-term services and supports aspect of the Florida Medicaid plans. Be careful not to go into another state or go into an MMA plan by accident. Look specifically for long-term care waiver as it relates to Florida Medicaid. Access that enrollee handbook and it will give you detailed information about how to move through the grievance process. The grievance can be filed orally or in writing. Uh, the plan, once it's received, must acknowledge receipt of the grievance within five days. It can be filed at any time, so there's no deadline, as there would be if there was a denial, for example, of, you know, just coming up with an example. If they deny incontinence briefs and they send a written notice of adverse benefit determination, there's going to be a specific appeal deadline in which you can file your internal plan appeal. That does not hold true for a grievance. You can file a grievance at any time after uh, the incident that you want to grieve about has occurred. Once you file the grievance, the plan must decide it within 90 days. Um, here, because I know there's lots of lawyers in the room, we've put in the applicable federal and uh, Florida federal regs and Florida rule as they relate to a grievance. Um, so you can dig into that to really understand the nitty gritty of these particular requirements. Um, again, we use grievances for a variety of things, and I'm going to, in a second, go through a case example of where we successfully used a grievance and complaint. I will say I never, it is my own practice to never file a grievance with a plan um, without also filing a complaint with the Agency for Healthcare Administration. Next slide, please. So what is that? Uh, the Agency for Healthcare Administration runs the statewide Medicaid managed care complaint hub, which includes complaints to file regarding long-term care waiver plans. Um, if an enrollee is having trouble accessing services or is encountering other problems with their long-term care plan, I like to give the example I think I gave just a second ago. Let's say the contact information for the individual is incorrect on the plan or their durable power of attorney. Um, is not the one being contacted through the plan or the plan won't speak to anybody but the individual, even when the individual prefers they speak to the DPOA. Those are kind of the things that, uh, that necessitate a grievance and also an ACA complaint. The uh, complaints are reviewed and responded to by trained ACA professionals. So these are individuals who are specifically tasked every day with uh, responding to the complaints that are filed with the agency. Um, they're very knowledgeable about the long-term care waiver um, and requirements, uh, specifically under contract. Um, and it helps ACA identify issues that indicate systemic problems. So I can tell you on the back end of our advocacy, if we've determined that there's um, certain issues that continue to arise, for example, network adequacy, there's not a sufficient number of providers in any given uh, managed care plan network to provide services to an individual then having individuals file complaints with ACA is a really good way to have both ACA track those problems and see systemically what's going on, but also for us to then turn around later and do public records requests and demonstrate that you know, those systemic problems exist and that ACA had knowledge about them. Um, while some issues are not amenable to resolution through the complaint portal and may ultimately require a fair hearing, uh, I would say that this informal complaint process is not time intensive and it really may result in a quick resolution. So you'll also find us filing ACA complaints a lot when we have um, very serious cases, when we have cases of individuals who uh, need immediate emergent services and the plan have um, has perhaps not 
acknowledged uh, critical due process rights, like for example, continuing services at the request of the individual during an appeal, then we find that filing an ACA complaint um, and raising those emergent circumstances with ACA can really get quick attention and response that otherwise we would not get waiting for um, a fair hearing to come to and getting in front of a fair hearing officer. Next slide, please. So here's just kind of the process for filing a complaint. Again, I wanna reiterate that for the grievance process, which can be coupled with this, the grievance goes to the managed care plan, the managed care plan decides the grievance. The complaint goes to ACA, ACA decides the complaint. So what the grievance does is establishes a nice record with the plan, gives the plan the opportunity to respond and also has some nice timelines as we detailed back in those federal regulations about how the plan has to respond in writing. But ACA really serves as a way to keep that plan accountable. So if you're only filing a grievance with the plan, then uh, it's, it's up to the plan to decide whether or not there's been a violation. Whereas ACA provides a bit more of a non-biased approach to uh, whatever issue you're seeking to resolve through the grievance and complaint process. So a complaint may be filed either online, um, and we have the link here, it's hyperlinked. I find uh, that filing a complaint online is, is uh, very easy to do, um, but you also can speak with a Medicaid representative by calling the toll-free number. Um, and I just wanna highlight, if you file the complaint online, uh, then you get a reference number at the end. Make sure that you copy it down because once you click close of the screen, that uh, reference number goes away forever. But if you copy it down, then um, ACA actually has a mechanism on the same website to go back in and enter the reference number and to determine the status of the complaint. Um, so it's really an excellent way of, of filing and tracking the complaint. Um, and then just notably, ACA's, on, especially for those non-lawyer advocates in the room, ACA's online portal does give the option to remain anonymous. So if, for example, you're a provider who, for whatever reason, which you shouldn't be, but for whatever reason, you don't want ACA to know your identity, but you are really concerned about the well-being of a client because the plan, let's say, has failed to establish a plan of care, um, an adequate plan of care after enrollment, then you can go ahead and you can go in and you can file the complaint and you can do so anonymously. Um, I wouldn't recommend it because then, uh, you know, you don't have a good way of keeping track of uh, how ACA proceeds through the processing of that complaint. But if it's something that really needs to be known and you want to remain anonymous, that is, that is an option. Next slide, please. Um, so I, I wanted to just give some best practices about filing a grievance and complaint. Um, what we do here at Florida Health Justice Project is uh, we draft the grievance and complaint in the form of a letter, um, either to the plan or to ACA or to both. What I really like about doing this is it organizes our thoughts. It also helps us identify which um, aspects of the law are going to attach to the particular violation. And then we can uh, uh, specifically give that guidance to the ACA Complaint Hub staff. I have on occasion had the ACA Complaint Hub staff comment to me that they really like it with, when a lawyer files a complaint because we tend to track um, the obligations both in federal reg and state law. And it makes it easier for them to hold the plan accountable when they can quickly reference those legal obligations of the plan. I think similarly, um, even more useful, as I state here, is citations to the model contract. As I mentioned earlier, I put those, um, those links to those core contract provisions as well as the long specific to long-term care waiver provisions. Um, I, uh, in any given circumstance, when I'm brought a complaint or a grievance by a, a particular individual, I really like to go through those contract provisions and try to tie as many viola violations of the contract to that letter that I'm writing. And again, that gives the ACA Complaint Hub staff the ability, the power to really go to the plan and say, listen, uh, this is where you told ACA, you made a uh, guarantee to ACA that you would um, do something. Let's say, for example, that you would ensure that there was an adequate net network of providers. You're violating that. Um, and that you can even tie to reasons for liquidated damages, which can be found in the contract. So really what you're doing is you're helping the ACA Complaint Hub staff do their job and getting uh, the issue resolved for your client. The other resource I wanna uh, point out briefly is the National Health Law Program Issue Briefs on Managed Care. They do a really excellent job of digging into 42 CFR Part 438 
in talking about how um, they even have tip boxes about how to best incorporate those federal regulations into your advocacy. Um, I find it to be an immensely useful resource, resource and really encourage it, your use of it um, in you know, filing complaints and grievances. Um, so when you're uploading your letter, which the complaint hub should give you the option. Um, I've not been able to figure out the magic of this. Sometimes the complaint hub gives you the option to attach documents. When it does do that, we uh, uh, upload a copy of our letter as well as any releases the client has signed to allow us to speak on their behalf, both to ACA and the, in the plan. I always have the client sign a release for ACA and I always have the client sign a release for the plan. And that way both have to talk to me and I upload those with my letter to the complaint hub. I also attach any relevant evidence, for example, letters from doctors or letters from um, friends who are concerned about the situation, whatever evidence that might be, um, upload that to the complaint to support my, my grievance um, or complaint. I include my contact information as secondary contact. You'll see that option. And that way, uh, ACA always reaches out directly to me after they talk with the client. As I say, said, there will be a reference number at the end of the filing of the complaint. I always save that and regularly follow up directly with ACA. I think the key takeaway of any of them is when you file a complaint with ACA, um, you certainly can get excellent results, but you're going to have to follow up. Once you file a complaint, do not expect that ACA will follow up directly with you. You need to be the squeaky wheel. You need to make sure that they are doing, um, doing the work on their part. Uh, and then when there are serious allegations at issue, threat of harm to the client, I think I mentioned earlier, for example, um, a, let's say a client has been discharged from the hospital and the plan has failed to find a provider, adequate provider to come in and provide uh, regular home health care services, putting the um, client at, at its you know, serious uh, medical risk, then that might be a time that both you file a grievance, you file a complaint. Remember, there's not been a denial of service. They've approved the home health service hours. They just don't have adequate staffing for those home health service hours. But in that instance, given the um, serious risk of harm that's posed to your client, I think it's uh, a time when you want to consider uh, copying, especially if you're an attorney, copying um, assistant general counsel at the agency so they understand that you're very serious about this um, and that, you, you know, you're willing to move through to take more serious legal action if it's not addressed imminently. Um, and so we did have a question that came into yeah. the chat. Um, it is a question about uh, sort of the, the technology, which from what I'm hearing, <laughs> the, the technology of these uh, complaints and grievances seems uh, difficult. Uh, the question is, have you found a way to screen print the online complaint? Once you submit, there is no such option. If I print before submission, I don't get an accurate rendering. Maybe it's just my computer? So, um... I would say, actually, I'm probably not the best person to ask about that. I have never, even, it's never even occurred to me to try to screen print the complaint. What I would say, two things, I'd say that's why it's nice, which I'm sure this person already knows because they've, it's occurred to them to uh, print out a screen, but that's why it's important to save the complaint hub number. Um, no, that does not attach to any specific allegations, but that's why I like to have a copy of the letter drafted, and that's the very specific complaint that I'm inputting into the complaint hub, whether that's attaching it as a form document or copying and paste it into the comments form. Um, but that way, you know, you have a rendering of exactly what you filed. Um, so that's the best I can say. Otherwise, I'm I'm a bit of a Luddite and I am not very good at doing print screen or anything like that. I'm constantly Googling those kinds of questions. So I apologize. Um, I don't know, does anybody else have any experience? If so, drop it in the chat and please give us those hints. Uh, An option is to screenshot. Um, if you have a, like a Mac, you can do command shift four and just screenshot your entire screen and print that. Um, I do that frequently. <laughs> Maybe my problem is that I'm a PC person. <laughs> That's probably it. Well, there you go. We've got some options. And if any more come through, I will read them out loud. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think we can move on to the next slide. 
Yeah, so I wanted to uh, just give an example of uh, our use of uh, complaints and grievances with clients. This is Aline. She's from Jacksonville, Florida. This is actually chapter two of her story. Chapter one of her story includes what Melissa is going to touch on shortly, which was denying um, significant reduction, I'm sorry, appealing significant reductions of her care um, and the plan failing to continue those benefits as requested. So Aline uh, really runs the gamut in terms of her experience in advocating uh, with her managed care plan. Um, but in chapter two of her story, she was going very long periods of time every weekend without home health aids, which she relies on for some very basic care, including um, you know, personal hygiene, personal care assistance for related to bathing and toileting, as well as meal preparation and some tra limited transferring. So as you can imagine, if she doesn't have a home health aid coming in every day, um, she is uh, she's not in a good place and she's um, really at some points, you know, increasing the risk of hospitalization because she can't get her uh, personal care directly addressed for days at a time. So uh, when she contacted us about filing the appeals um, and we were working with her to collect that story, she mentioned these gaps in care. Um, and at that point, our amazing advocates identified that, in fact, uh, under the managed care contract that I uh, linked to earlier, there is an obligation on the managed care plan to establish uh, gap plans, which means that they have to find a backup uh, services providers so that when one service provider cannot show up to do their job or otherwise provide a service, there is a backup plan in place. And so through months long advocacy through the complaint and grievance process, I believe two complaints and grievances were filed. Um, we were finally successful in getting the plan to uh, uh, create and administer a gap plan for Aline so that there was a second home health services agency available in her area to come in on the weekends and address her care. Um, that's the kind of significant advocacy that can be done just through a complaint and grievance. So while it seems informal and kind of a not very heavy lift in terms of legal advocacy, as long as you are able to link what the client needs um, to the obligations of the plan, either through managed contract provisions, federal regulations, or state regulations, as long as you're allowed or you're able to make that link to a plan obligation. And just as importantly, as long as you stay on top of ACA in the plan to implement and recognize those obligations in the law, then you really can have very significant impact on the client's lives. Another example I would give is just a um, lack of a provider completely. Um, this was non-long-term care related, uh, but along the same lines, uh, there was a requirement that an individual receive a specific type of mental health service. And we were able to advocate through just the complaint and grievance process to make sure they got access to a very specific mental health service provider. So again, these are, um, you know, uh, uh, light lifts in terms of what it requires of you, um, you know, in, in, in legal advocacy, but really have a significant impact on individuals' lives. Next slide, please. Um, so what is the difference between a grievance complaint and an appeal? Um, each plan is required to have a grievance and appeal process that complies with the federal Medicaid managed care regulations. So as I stated earlier, a grievance is really gonna be quality access to care or uh, uh, concerns with how the plan is implementing your care. Again, the appeal process is gonna be related to you've requested a service, you are receiving a service and they are taking it away or they're denying it. Um, one way that you can identify this is that the major difference between a grievance and an appeal is that an appeal should be filed when there's an adverse benefit determination. While grieve and that's again, when the uh, plan is refusing to authorize a specific service or benefit for you, while a grievance would be just the enrollee is unhappy with the plan. And I shouldn't say just though, remember a second ago, the very uh, significant example I gave. So that was, you know, unhappy with the plan, yes, but unhappy with the plan, for actions that were really uh, resulting in harm to the to the client, potential harm to the client. Um, both can be filed orally in writing. 
And again, just citing here to the um, procedure and requirements uh, outlined in the in the uh, model contract as well in, as in 42 CFR 438. So probably a main takeaway here is in terms of the legal hooks, the documents you want to be intimately familiar with when you're doing um, uh, uh, advocacy for healthcare services through the long-term care waiver is know your core contract provisions in the model contract know your long-term services and supports contract provisions in the model contract, and know 42 CFR 438. Next slide, please. Um, so I'm gonna turn it over to Melissa to talk about appeals. Hello, um, so an appeal, basically with this, you can do um, an oral request for an appeal it has to be followed with a signed appeal within 10 days, unless the request is for an expedited appeal. Um, you can also make a request for an like orally. We've seen issues before with plans saying that they will not take a request orally, but they are required to. Um, so that's just something to watch out for. And so yeah, standard appeals must be filed orally or in writing within 60 days from the date of the adverse benefit determination notice and must be resolved within 30 days. So there are very strict timing requirements for this. Um, and we've also seen sometimes that plans will wait until the 30th day to send something. Um, and then there is also something called an expedited appeal. So expedited appeals are for when the standard resolu resolution could seriously jeopardize the enrollee's life, physical or mental health, or ability to attain, maintain, or regain maximum function. So this is just like a sped up process. Um, and so for expedited appeals, they must be resolved within 48 hours after the managed care plan receives the request, whether that's orally or in writing. And the plan also has to provide oral notice to the enrollee by the close of business on the day of the resolution and written notice to the enrollee within two calendar days of the disposition. So very strict timing requirements and there are things to look for um, and make sure that the plan is actually doing. So if you are asking for an expedited appeal, you wanna make sure that the plan is complying with this. And then um, a notice of adverse benefit determination it is governed by 42 CFR 438.404, uh, which gives you um, the timely and adequate notice of adverse benefit determination. We love federal regs. Um, and then 42 CFR 438.404C uh, will give you the timing of the notice. Um, and so for terminations, suspensions, or reduction of previously authorized services, the notice is 10 days. Um, so the plan is required to give this send this ad notice of adverse benefit determination 10 days before the services are set to either be reduced, terminated. Um, Melissa, can I jump in too just quickly and yeah. say, um, particularly with uh, the uh, one more slide back, particularly with the expedited appeals, um, if an individual, again, just coming back to complaints and grievances, if it's uh, such that whatever action the plan is taking could seriously jeopardize the enrollee's life, physical or mental health, or ability to attain, maintain, or gain maximum function, that is also uh, well-suited for a complaint or a grievance, um, in addition to filing the expedited appeal. And the one other thing I just wanted to say about that is, um, it's always good to have a doctor or other provider write a letter uh, saying that whatever service is being denied or terminated or reduced, um, could lead to, you know, and then issue this conclusion um, with, of course, some medical evidence to back it up. Sorry to interrupt. I'm sorry, Melissa. Oh, no, please jump in at any time. <laughs> um, okay. And so now fair hearings. So the jurisdiction and right to fair hearings is in 59G-1.103. Um, 59G-1.100 has everything you need to know about these things. Um, and so everything about the request for a hearing is in section eight. So the request for a fair hearing can be orally or in writing. So once the plan sends something called the notice of plan appeal resolution, at the end, there's always uh, basically like instructions on how you could request a fair hearing. Generally, what I've done is um, by email to ACA, they have a like fair hearings unit. I like to send the request in writing always, uh, but you can also do it orally. And so the timing requirements for that are, it has to be within 90 days of the date of a required notice of action. So once uh, the individual gets that 
notice of plan appeal resolution or, um, or 120 days that required for the notice of plan appeal resolution. Sorry, so the notice of action is different. Um, but yeah, there are timing requirements for when you could request it. And it is just something to keep in mind. Um, and some of the rights that enrollees do have during a fair hearing are they have the right to bring witnesses. So this is when you can have a doctor come in, you can have their caregiver, um, friend, I've seen friends. Um, and it's also, it's when they're like, enrollee can make legal and factual arguments both in person and in writing. Um, they can present evidence, including new evidence that wasn't available at the time of the decision. So this would be something like if a doctor says that now their health has declined or they're having other issues, um, this can be brought in. And then you also have the right to review medical records and the case file free of charge and in advance of the hearing. So you can re request all of this um, to do that. And then some of the like tips for hearing prep are if you're an attorney filing a notice of appearance, um, you would send that to ACA's Medicaid Fair Hearing Unit. Um, and then once you file that, ACA will send you back an authorized representative form. Um, and something to keep in mind with that is if the um, caregiver of the enrollee is the one who's asking you to represent them, you have to make sure everything is signed. Um, I've seen in the past before uh, when someone who is an authorized rep and like or a caregiver has asked for a Medicaid fair hearing, they've been sent an order to show cause and they had to send in their power of attorney to show that they in fact have the right to request this. Um, but if you are the attorney and you're filing this notice of appearance, ACA will send you a form to fill out, which is the authorized rep form and that will come after and it has the case number on it and you need to have that to be able to represent them. Um, another thing is to ask for discovery. So usually in the hearing process, that's one of the first things to do, ask for discovery for the plan, from the plan. Um, also, normally because the Medicaid fair hearings generally, once you request one, they're scheduled uh, pretty soon after. So asking for a continuance so you have that time to review discovery, to do depositions, um, and to fully go over everything. And so another thing that's very important is um, continuation of benefits. So while an appeal is pending, um, while you're waiting for the Medicaid fair hearing, an enrollee has a right to receive uh, the continuation of benefits. So when a beneficiary's previously authorized services are terminated, suspended, or reduced, they have a right to receive continued coverage of the medical services pending the outcome of an appeal in fair hearing. So this is something that is super important to ask for because if there is a reduction and an example is like personal care hours, the enrollee can request that this continues while the appeal is pending or while you're waiting for the fair hearing. Um, and the importance of the right to aid pending for low-income individuals was recognized by the United States Supreme Court in the case of Goldberg versus Kelly. And I'll just, oh, sorry. Yeah, Katie. <laughs> oh, I was just gonna jump in and say, again, um, if the individual takes all the steps necessary to request a continuation of benefits and does it in a timely manner, and the plan does not continue those benefits, uh, I will just harp once again on saying that would be an excellent issue for a complaint and a grievance. Sorry, yeah. Melissa. Of course. Uh, and so services have to be continued if all of the following occur. So the appeal involves a termination, suspension, or reduction of a previously authorized services. Services were ordered by an authorized provider. Uh, the period covered by original authorization has not expired. Uh, the enrollee timely files for continued benefits on or before 10 calendar days of the plan's notice of adverse benefit determination. Um, so something with that is I've seen cases where an individual has uh, requested services to continue orally. Uh, also very important to send that in writing. Um, like in this case, they did not receive the service to, services, uh, the continuation of services, which is very bad. Um, so just like follow up in writing, make sure everything is documented. Um, and then if the beneficiary is provided with continued coverage of the services uh, and ultimately loses the appeal, the cost of the service can be recouped. So we have seen plans state that to the enrollee that if they do lose the appeal, that they're gonna have to pay back that. Um, so it's just something to be aware of. Um, and then some best practices for continuation of benefits uh, to ensure that the services continue, the appeal must be received by the plan within 10 calendar days of when the notice of adverse 
of adverse benefit determination was sent. Um, if the appeal is upheld, the fair hearing request must then be filed within 10 calendar days of when the notice of appeal resolution was sent. And then the request for continuation of services should always be in writing, 42 CFR 438.420C talks about that. Um, and then Katie, do you have anything? Else? I mean, only coming back again to you know my mantra, which is, um, for example, we have heard of experiences, we have dealt with experiences where clients request an appeal orally with continuation of benefits. Um, when they did not receive a physical copy of the notice of adverse benefit determination. So they learn of uh, the adverse action after perhaps the um, 10 calendar days of when the notice is dated, um, but they never received the notice itself in writing, uh, only perhaps an oral notice or the service was stopped. And that's how they knew that the, you know, the service was no longer authorized um, in those instances. I bet you can guess what I'm going to say. It's very good to file a complaint and grievance. And so even if, for example, your client um, uh, missed the 10 calendar day deadline, but for good reason for not receiving the written notice of adverse benefit determination in a timely manner, then ACA and the plan should work towards reinstating those services pending the outcome of the appeal. So you know, I guess the moral of the story there is there are very specific uh, procedures to be followed within 42 CFR 438 in the managed care contracts. And uh, when, it, when it comes to filing appeals and requests for fair hearing, when those procedures are not followed, that's when you can use the complaint and grievance process to make sure that things get back on track. Um, and some other like best practices for having a Medicaid fair hearing are to capitalize on the availab availability of discovery. So ask for anything you wanna see, um, any policies, those are always very helpful to see, like if uh, a service is being reduced, um, there's, there we've seen some interesting coverage policies that uh, seem to be very restrictive. So making sure you ask for all of those things. Um, yeah, so obtain all coverage policies used by the plan. Uh, because they do often run afoul of Medicaid coverage obligations. Uh, read and know Florida Admin Code uh, 59G-1.100. I have it saved, I think, 17 times on my computer. And also every time Google it. So just knowing it, um, make sure that you enter your notice of appearance and you want to have the client sign um, the template authorized rep form as soon as you get it. Um, and just making sure like, it's kind of an interesting process because you don't get the authorized rep form until you enter the notice of appearance. Um, because like you can't, even if you have it from another case and try to change the number, you need like the specific one they send you. So uh, super important to have, because if you don't send in that authorized rep form, you might get an order to show cause. Um, and then um, there is base stamp evidence. If Katie, you wanna Explain oh, that. yeah, just make sure that you're keeping track of any evidence that you file by putting a bait stamp on there before you you file it. And that way it's um, all hearings are done telephonically. So you want to have a good way of being able to orally reference any evidence uh, during the time. I'll also say um, related. I don't mean I'm sorry, Melissa, um, but re relate just because it's related. Uh, you can ask to submit proposed final orders, which I really in my administrative fair hearing practice really prefer to submit proposed final orders because it's a way to organize the case and the evidence that you've presented and really make a compelling um, argument on behalf of your client, ensure the fair hearing officer understands the facts and how they apply to the law as it relates to your client, what evidence is relevant um, and, and what issues are to be decided. I have found that under uh, ACA's rules, they will deny every time your request to submit a proposed final order. That does not mean, however, that you shouldn't make a, a clear record by making the request. And so related to that, of course, is once you're drafting that proposed final order, then having bait stamps evidence uh, that, was, that was entered previously is, makes it easier to reference with whatever, whatever um, legal writing you're doing. Yes. Sorry, I see your question in the chat, Val. So uh, Valerie Greenfield asked, is Bates reference to sequential numbering of exhibits? Yes, a Bates stamp is uh, sequential, sequential numbering of exhibits, 
which you can do um, through handwriting <laughs> um, on your exhibit pages that you then scan in and file with the Peer Hearing Office or Adobe actually has Adobe Pro or Adobe Acrobat DC. If, um, if you go into the program, it actually gives you the option to do automatic bait stamping on any PDF files. It's a great function. I highly recommend it. That's it. Sorry, Melissa. I talk too much. <laughs> no, do not worry. Um, and then, yeah, if the client needs corrective action, uh, it's important to request that in writing. The big theme of this is make sure you have a record of everything um, and you want to just keep all of that. And then I'll just jump in on corrective action too and say, um, so corrective action is the notion that uh, if an individual has, for example, had to pay out of pocket for services because they weren't properly continued or they didn't request them in a timely manner and the hearing officer eventually decides in favor of your client and decides that the agency, I'm sorry, the plan action to reduce services was erroneous, um, then ACA has taken the position in 59G-1.100 that that corrective action must be requested in writing. Now, it's our position that that um, contradicts uh, federal law in terms of what's required for corrective action, so please note that. But of course, um, you know, for the benefit of your client, it's always best to play by the agency's rules, whether or not they're actually legal. So that's why we suggest, you know, just following to the T, 59G-1.100, and all of its requirements, uh, including requesting corrective action in writing, even if um, that in fact is not what uh, federal Medicaid law requires. And if you have those cases where your client was not given corrective action because it was not put in writing, then we would, we would love to um, work with you to advocate with ACA to change that rule. And I think you an answered this question, Katie, and I'm sorry, I just saw that it popped up two minutes ago, so I think you answered it, but going back to Bates numbers, the question was, um, is it in reference to a sequential numbering of exhibits? The reason I'm at bringing it up is it's not just exhibits from my understanding, it's um, all pages in given anything you're filing, so I don't know if you want to clarify that or... Uh, well, yeah, I think of as exhibits as any documentary evidence that you're filing in support of your claim. So I, th I think that's that's correct. That the Bates reference is the sequential numbering of, of exhibits and exhibits can include, of course, documentary evidence. Got it. Thank you. Um, and so this is just an example of someone we helped in a Medicaid fair hearing. Uh, the issue in this case was her home delivered meals were being reduced um, and the standard for it was um, we thought overly restrictive because it required that the person be able to ambulate to the door to pick up the meals and had some other like strange requirements. Uh, and so in this case, I entered a notice of appearance, I asked for discovery and we ended up, re her home delivered meals ended up getting reinstated after communication with the plant's attorney. Um, and she was able to receive those home delivered meals. Uh, but this is one of the reasons it's so important to get all of those coverage policies because we actually like went through and read them and compared it to like the federal regs, uh, as well as like the covered services for Florida Medicaid. Um, and so this was a good example of just like documenting everything. Uh, we also wrote a story about her, um, which is something we do. We combine different strategies for advocacy here. Um, and so this was ended up working out, um, but why it's also just very, very important to look at those coverage policies and to see what they're saying um, and asking for that Medicaid fair hearing. And so Katie, if you want to give the background on uh, Wright versus ACA. Absolutely. So uh, I guess time flies. Um, about a year ago, I think maybe a bit longer, um, there's a federal Medicaid regulation that says that uh, um, state Medicaid, single state Medicaid agencies are required to make their uh, Medicaid fair hearing decisions publicly available. Um, so we proceeded with a declaratory action in state court to uh, uh, hold ACA to the obligation under, we had some theories under Chapter 120, with the, which is Florida's Administrative Procedure Act, as well as federal Medicaid law, um, to uh, force ACA to make all of those fair hearing decisions publicly available on the Division of Administrative Hearings website. And um, very sadly, <laughs> we lost the trial court level. Um, very gladly, we have a pro bono appellate attorney who's taken on the case and is representing us in the first CCA. Um, 
So the fight is not over. But in the meantime, in an effort to moot us out, um, the agency turned over a significant amount of the long-term care services so that right Viaca actually covers all Medicaid fair hearing decisions that would not be related just to long-term services and supports or those decisions through the long-term care waiver. But because our plaintiff had specifically asked for fair hearing decisions related to long-term care waiver, they disclosed those fair hearing decisions to us. And um, then I gratefully passed off those decisions to Melissa uh, to start reviewing um, for specific trends. And she's really come up with some very interesting findings in that regard. Yeah, so, so far I've reviewed around 80 cases, so half. And what we're seeing right now is that over 90% of the unreleased unreal were represented. Um, I think I maybe saw, I wanna say it was like three people that were actually represented by an attorney, so that's something big to see that most people go in without an advocate. Um, they also, what we were seeing was that most unreleased present very little evidence. So the plans would have like anywhere from 100 to 800 pages. And a lot of unreleased were going in with like four pages or three pages. I think the max I saw was like 100. And it was a lot of just like the same evidence the plan had sent in, like medical records. Um, and in most of the cases, the unreleased were losing. Uh, usually if someone did win, it was a termination. So like in any of the reductions or the denials, nothing, no one, none of the unreleased were getting any relief. Uh, it was only when there was a termination. I think there was one or two cases where they did win with a reduction, but it's a very low number of people actually winning these fair hearings, which is just like a, an interesting trend to see. Um, and also shows some systemic issues that if an unruly is going unrepresented with no evidence there, when the plan is showing that they have like, usually it was eight witnesses, anywhere between like four to 10 witnesses. And a lot of unruly were going in with none or just one. So that. Yeah. And just to clarify, uh, give you a sense of the scope of the problem. So, or the issue, I should say, and um, the 160 cases that were provided to us, were again just related to the long-term care waiver and they were just related to three very specific services on the long-term care waiver please don't make me remember what those services were but so um and it was just over the course of three years so 160 cases where 90 percent of the enroll enrollees were unrepresented 80 percent plus percent lost their case um in just a course of three years um very concerning and i think demonstrates uh, the need for more advocacy when it comes to these cases. So I'll take a chance to interrupt you. We have another question, um, an evidentiary kind of strategy question. Uh, do you ever submit photos of your clients as exhibits to help bring a face to the problem or are the hearings done by video chat function? Um, I, I can answer that. Uh, to the first part of the question, do I ever submit photos of clients as exhibits? Again, um, Valerie, I just need you as a consulting expert in terms of administrative fair hearing um, processes. The thought had never occurred to me. Um, I do try to bring a face to the problem. I generally do that through um, uh, submission of, you know, um, uh, 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 pre-hearing um, stipulations with the opposing counsel. So I try to paint a picture of the issues factually um, with the client. Uh, of course, the opposing counsel doesn't stipulate to that, but, but those are the portions of the pre-hearing um, uh, statement that I you know, uh, bring myself. And then uh, the other thing that we always do is we have um, the individual in the, if possible, and any of the family members who are undoubtedly providing um, uh, uh, the, you know, providing the stopgap and the um, holes in care uh, to testify. And those can be very compelling as well. Um, and then uh, you cannot do an ACA more important. So in the DCF Office of Appeal Hearings, you can do a video chat function as well as in-person hearings. Those are options that DCF provides and that an individual can elect as an entitlement. The same is not true for ACA fair hearings. They're all done telephonically and there is no video chat function option. Um, it's something that we should really advocate more with, with ACA, because I honestly think it would make it easier on the hearing officers to be able to conduct the hearing too. Um, 
so so yeah thank you for that idea it's a very good one and we will absolutely uh, think about doing that in the future yeah something we have done uh pre-hearing is with the stories um usually what we'll do is if the individual agrees to be featured in the story and to talk about what they're going through and they do give a picture um, we've sent that to the plans council before so they can get an idea of also who the individual is and they know it's a person it's not just a number um, and that has worked in the past. I see another, is there another question? I see something before in the chat. No, not another question, but I, um, the Valerie had asked the photos in your presentation today are compelling, which is why I asked. Oh, thank you. Valerie. Thank you. <laughs> All right, I'll keep you posted if another comes through. Perfect. Thank you. Um, and so with that, we also have done public records requests. Um, and so a there was a change to the priority score notices um, in July of 2021. So the way it used to work was that if you did the screening with usually like usually the ADRC, so the uh, Aging and Disability Resource Center for the like LTC waiver, you would get put on the wait list. Um, and now the difference is if you have like a score that is high enough, I think it's three or above, you are on the wait list and you're supposed to receive a new notice that has different information. And so I did a public records request to DCF. Um, so I asked for all of the hearing decisions from appeals. Um, so it was appealing your priority score from July, 2021 to February of 2022. So there was 163 total appeals. So these are individuals who received a priority score and they did um, they wanted to appeal it because it didn't, they, it didn't reflect their current health, what was going on. Um, and I received five hearing decisions um, and so some of the important things to note are you can appeal your priority score. So if you apply for the long term care waiver and you are not happy with the score and it doesn't accurately reflect um, your health, what's going on, you can appeal this. Um, and then also something to note is that the ADRC, which is the Aging and Disability Resource Center, can manually change the priority score. So in one of the like uh, calls I did uh, for an individual to help him apply for the LTC waiver at the end of the call, they told us what the score was. Um, and so like his score thankfully was high. Uh, so he was able to be on the wait list. But if not, you can call uh, and you can request an appeal. And depending on like what you present, the IDRC can actually manually change the priority score, which is something we I saw in one of the decisions. Um, and we did see that individuals were successful in appealing their priority scores and getting on the wait list. Um, but something that was another issue we noted was that there was an over redaction of the hearings so we didn't know any of the diagnoses of the individuals they redacted obviously the name but just the entire diagnosis so no idea what was going on um that was something i wanted to look at to see what appeals were actually like uh you know being or agreed to like basically who they were accepting the appeals from what were the issues so we could see if there was a trend there was, if there were certain cases that they said oh this health issue we are going to like accept it or not but there was no way to see it so i just requested another uh public records for party score appeals from before the notice uh to compare the number of the appeals uh before the new notice new notices versus after to see if this like new party score notice has encouraged more individuals to appeal the score and explain the process to them um, or if there is no change, and also um, to get copies of those hearings without the reduction of diagnoses. So I'm waiting to hear back on that one. Um, oh, and something I just wanted to talk about is that there is the Long-Term Care Ombudsman Program. It's a volunteer program uh, where you investigate and respond to complaints from residents of long-term care facilities. I'm actually involved in it. Um, they do yearly assessments of the long-term care facilities. So this is nursing homes, ALFs, um, basically any long-term care facility in the state of Florida. It's run by the Department of Elder Affairs. Um, and you really are an advocate for the residents. So you investigate complaints, if there are any issues, you also assess the facility. Um, it's a great opportunity. They're always looking for volunteers. Uh, and has, it's also been like a great learning experience to learn about like the other side of it because I do mostly HCBS issues. Um, so like home health care, but also seeing what the facilities are like and what the residents are going through and some of the issues that come up um, in these facilities. And then this is just uh, on our website, we have a lot of resources related to the long-term care waiver. So we have the advocate's guide to the Florida long-term care Medicaid waiver. Uh, we are currently working on the fifth edition and that will be out soon. 
that includes um, changes to the new model contracts because there was a change to them in September of this year. Um, so some of the pages are different, uh, some different information, as well as the new waiver that was approved April 1st. Um, we also have a video about navigating uh, home and community-based services. Uh, the video is great because you can go to different sections. There's handouts on it. Uh, we also have a lot of Know Your Rights materials on our website. So anything um, that you might want to access is there. And we are at the Florida Health Justice Project .org. Um, And so, yeah, any questions or comments? <laughs> And please always feel free, if no questions or comments now, um, know that we are always available to, you know, uh, walk through cases or, um, you know, direct you to, to resources. So please feel free to use our email address at will um, to ask any questions that might come up.